So here we are rolling on to final. You can see that I have uh, three green, uh, so that right main is indicating down and locked. Uh, approach was normal with that 10 to 15 degree flaps and 85 mile per hour approach speed. Uh, my apologies for all the oil on the camera. This is uh, unfortunately the, the best external view I have for showing the uh, upcoming event. So that moment, I wasn't sure if uh, if I had actually touched the wing uh, when the gear had collapsed. You know, I added power. I, uh, I was pretty confident I hadn't touched the propeller, uh, but I hadn't felt it in the controls that I had touched the wing. I hadn't felt a, a grinding on that right wing. Uh, but meanwhile, while being heroic, I, I'm not sure that uh, aborting the landing had done anything else more than put me sort of in, a, in another predicament, right? What am I going to do now? So after that gear collapsed, the right main indicated uh, unlocked. You can see that on the left side of the cockpit. So I did the standard shimmy shimmy coco pop, you know, directional and, and uh, G oscillations to try to get the gear to shake out uh, with no change. I also took a moment to check for uh, handling in the roll axis. Again, concerned that that right aileron had made contact with the runway. You can see here I reached for the gear like I'm going to pull it up uh, to commit to landing on the belly. And this was probably the, um, the first moment where I start to let the owner into the cockpit. So again, in this bigger context of Jim not being an airplane owner, uh, there was a lot of stuff that um, uh, I was sort of letting him know as he needed to know it rather than trying to do sort of a deep dive up front. And it was at this moment I knew, you know, I had shaken the airplane, the gear wasn't going to come out. I knew now that I was going to crash today. Uh, and now my next thought was, well, how do I, you know, warn Jim or prepare Jim for what's coming? Because, you know, not being an airplane guy, he, this is this is all going to come at him really fast. And so that's when you can see I hesitate to uh, to fiddle with the gear, and I start figuring out, well, am I going to text him? Am I going to call him? Like, how how will I let him know? Again, Jim had a habit of leaving the airport during the flights. From his perspective, again, this is a proven airplane, right? This is it, it was a car guy uh, hanging out at the airport. Maybe isn't his thing. I don't know, but he would, you know, go. Uh, away when I went away because he figured there was no reason to be there. So I needed to get him back to the airport to kind of let him know what was coming. It's at this moment that uh, Brett came on the radio. Hello, Compton traffic. There is what looks to be a P51 in the left downwind for 251. Are you on frequency? Yeah, we're on the frequency. Okay, yeah, I'm an archer that was just parked and I just had noticed that your, as I'm sure you already saw that when you went around, is that your right main uh, kind of wheel buckled. So this is a, a fascinating new variable that I've never dealt with before. You know, I've got a fair amount of experience with, you know, with a well-briefed safety chase. I have a fair amount of experience with indoctrinated uh, team members that are on the ground and trying to provide assistance. But in this case, I have this voice on the radio, person I don't know personally at all, who can potentially add a lot of value. Uh, you know, I need all the help I can get at this point, but you know, it's hard to know uh, what he knows, right? W what is his background? And just as I'm starting to figure out uh, how to uh, how to talk to Brett about all this stuff, uh, the engine tries to quit. Everything's okay, and the, the gear is back down now, so you have two uh, two fully down, but it did buckle when you put pressure on it. In that moment, you can see the uh, dine -in cycle, you can see the tack cycle. So globally, right, uh, as an engine operator in this moment, the engine had stumbled. Uh, I knew the engine was electronically controlled, and therefore there wasn't like a you know a mixture knob I could play with, or you know the, the fuel system was relatively simple. There wasn't much I could do, so I wasn't confident that the engine wasn't going to stumble again. Uh, and with that, I sort of realized that uh, this whole thing was going to be over pretty quick. Another thing that sort of interestingly also gets imprinted in my mind in this moment is that I had wiggled the throttle, and that locks in as maybe being related to what's causing the engine to stumble. When you put pressure on it. Okay, copy off. So, uh, you're not in any position where you could uh, let the owner uh, be aware of what's going on with the gear. So at this point, I figure the engine is about to quit. Uh, I'm sort of on a base turn, sort of like I, I can make the runway from where I am. But again, I go back into this, like bringing the owner into the cockpit thing where I'm like, God, I'd just love to warn him about what's going on. You know, if, if Justin was here and he had a fire bottle, I wish, I'm wish i wishing that Justin was here for the impending crash that's coming. Yeah, I, 
I'm not from here, actually. I'm from Santa Monica. Do you have a number you want me to give him a call and let him know? So I give him Jim's number? Okay, I'll give him a call, and then I'll call you back with that, uh, with that response for you. Thank you. And just to be clear, uh, I'm going to want any debrief you got on the condition of that right gear. So the customer relations side was saying, let's let the customer know what's going on. The other side was, uh, I need to know what, what Brett knew, if anything, about uh, what had happened, you know, what things I couldn't see, things that were on the other side of the wing. What did he know about the position and condition of the gear? And, and based on that knowledge, uh, help me inform my decision whether we're going to try to land with the gear how it is, whether we're gonna try cycling the gear to try to get a different answer, or whether we're going to pull the gear up and land on the belly. Recognizing I had a little bit of time here, uh, I took the moment to clean the airplane up, so flaps up. Again, you can see I put my hand on the gear light lever like I'm gonna pull it up, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to try to involve Jim in the decision. Again, too much customer relations. Uh, so about 90 seconds pass here. Okay, I uh, just had a phone conversation with Jim and he's gonna make his way down towards the uh, craft where we have some radio communication for you. This next bit is some of the most fascinating uh, like radio communication stuff I've ever experienced in flight test. Sounds good, and then uh, if you got any debrief on what you saw, you said the gear buckled, I'm not sure what that means. Okay, so when your main wheels touched down, your left one was stable and your right one gave way, so it didn't really take any pressure, and it probably went probably went inward about 20 to 30 degrees, and then you must have sensed that and did go around. I've never met Brett. Uh, I don't know anything about his background, but the pressure is really high. So how do you maximize the efficiency of the conversation so that we can figure out who he is and get the information that he has, uh, you know, as efficiently as possible? Okay, so uh, buckled implies that the main strut may have collapsed. It appeared the strut was intact from your perspective? Yeah, it looks so. Um, it, yeah, it did. Give me a kind of a second to decipher exactly how to put that in words, but as soon as your right main touched, the entire uh, strut itself kind of bent inwards. Um, I guess it kind of gave way under the pressure of the lack of hydraulics, essentially. I think it goes without saying that this is a fantastic example of the value of really good safety chase. And when we say safety chase, people think about formation, they think about being in the right position. And I think what's illustrated here is that the more important thing is that you're able to speak the same language and have confidence on both sides of the conversation. So that the things I say mean the same thing in your head and vice versa. Right, so uh, from my perspective, my guess is the lock failed, so the strut is intact but the, the uh, lock is no longer functioning. Is that match what you think you saw? That is an affirmative, yes. Yeah, so if you wanted to do a, a kind of low pass here, we can kind of get an idea of what your strut looks like, make sure it looks healthy and solid still. Again, it was more than I could communicate in the moment, but the idea of doing a low pass to check gear position after that engine stumble, uh, it was gonna take a lot of convincing to put me in that position. Not so much the coming into the low pass, but that moment after the low pass where you're depending on the engine to get away from the ground and not end up in that neighborhood of houses. Uh, let's give uh, Jim a second here to get on the frequency. Temps are stable so far, but this thing doesn't like flying around with gear down. Understandably. Do you want to try to do some, I don't, I don't know anything about this plane, some G-force maneuvers and see if you can get it to lock? I already tried that, but no, I like where you're thinking. The only thing that's on my question mark is whether we just give up, suck the gear up, and land on the belly, or whether we had tried to put some pressure on that right gear. Okay, give me about two minutes, and I'll get back to you. you got plenty of fuel? Uh, we got probably another hour's worth of gas, but I don't think this is going to last that long. During the next three minutes it takes for Jim to get to the radio, I decide to uh, climb to altitude to slow the airplane to try again the shimmy shimmy cocoa pop but at a lower speed and also try cycling the gear to see if I can get a different answer as far as the down locks. Hey Elliot. Hey boss, how you doing? So uh, I assume you've tried the positive G thing to get the gear to lock down, right? I have. Again, just a fascinating communication problem. You do have some extra gas in that rear tank. And then, um, yeah, how about if you try to put the gear up and down again, or that's um, it's a side skid thing, so the airflow tries to push the gear outboard to lock it down? I uh, tried that already. I just haven't tried it at slow speed. So climbing up to altitude now, we'll try that. Uh, he was saying that uh, you're getting... And then the engine quit. So speeds 100 miles an hour were about 3,100 feet MSL. I'm basically directly over the runway on like an, a high upwind near the departure end of the runway. So that's a big left hand 180 to line up with downwind headed for low key. 
low-key being sort of uh, adjacent to and opposite heading of uh, your touchdown point. And here I have just a few seconds to try to troubleshoot. In the bigger context, I knew I was gonna crash today. I didn't see that there was much I was going to do in the cockpit. Even if I got the engine running, it wasn't going to change the outcome of the day very much. But I knew that what would absolutely change the outcome of the day is not making it to the airport. So I was absolutely focused on making it to the airport, less so on troubleshooting. Again, based on that previous stumble, I believe that sawing on the throttle had something to do with the engine quitting. Obviously it didn't work this time. And then it's a basic check of the switch positions in the cockpit. So, so there's three main switches that control the engine. There's the starter switch, the uh, coil switch, and the fuel injector switch. Uh, and then there's the row of circuit breakers. I check all those. And then after that just few seconds of troubleshooting, it's just focused on trying to make the airport. So this is an interesting moment where I decided I was high. So I make a couple S turns, the last one of which is pretty deep and then I turned back to the north, uh, back towards base, and that's when I knew I was in trouble. That last S turn was just way too deep, and now uh, with the wind coming out of the north, I was gonna have trouble making the airport. So I reached down and feathered the prop to increase my glide ratio. So again, there's different schools on whether or not you feather the prop or when you feather the prop. Uh, from my perspective, if I have the airport made, I'd rather keep the prop in the fine position so that I have it in moments like this as a last get out of jail free card to make the airport. Uh, I'm sure there'll be people that, uh, that feel the other way about it that you should feather immediately after an engine failure. So you can see right here as I'm cutting that corner from base to final, I think I can make the airport, but I know it's gonna be tight. Okay, so we've got a P-51 replica coming in with a gear issue. We've been communicating with him for the last 15 minutes. hard to communicate uh, on a long uh, emergency like this just how tired you are at the end of it and I didn't really feel it until this moment when the airplane came to a stop and I had to chant to myself fire 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 to remind myself what was the the rush to get out of the seat uh, I was just exhausted Here you got your plug. I was a British guy you were speaking to on the radio. I appreciate the help, man. No, the engine quit right as we were talking. Oh, wow. Congratulations, man. We're here. I appreciate it. You were very helpful. Thank you. You're very welcome, sir. I know you had other things to do today to besides Absolutely deal with this. Absolutely not. All right, it's just after uh, 1245 here in uh, Compton, California. Uh, just finished uh, having an emergency landing in the uh, Titan T-51. The uh, emergency started.